Thank you for joining us today. I'm Professor Susan Pascasello, and I'm the Director of the Law of International Development Initiative, also known as LIDI, at the O'Neill Institute at Georgetown Law. I'm really pleased to see so many students and alums from the Law Center, as well as our students and faculty and our colleagues from the Walsh School of Foreign Service and many practitioners joining us today. Liddy's goal is to focus on and draw attention to major legal issues and challenges facing the international development and humanitarian assistance sectors. The Liddy Speaker Series aims to highlight voices from across the international development landscape. For our first public event today, we'll be exploring how law and policy shape global humanitarian assistance. We look forward to your joining us for future conversations and sessions where we'll discuss such topics as protecting communities from sexual exploitation and abuse at the hands of international development and humanitarian assistance workers and structuring complex public-private partnerships and financial transactions to leverage international development programs and funds. The next Liddy Speaker Series will take place in fall of 2021. In the meantime, please stay in touch with Liddy through the O'Neill Institute's website and follow us on Facebook and Twitter. I'm delighted to now turn the conversation over to my co-professor at Georgetown Law, Amit Kardori. Amit? Uh, thanks, Susan. Uh, uh, my name is Amit Kardori. I co-teach the course on the Law of Humanitarian and International Development Assistance under the umbrella of Liddy here at Georgetown with Susan and our friend and colleague, Frank Walsh. Today's panel is on the delivery of international humanitarian assistance with a focus on the US legal framework and the on-the-ground practical realities. This includes issues of U.S. authorities and restrictions, including uniquely broad international disaster assistance statutory authorities and restrictive laws, such as the U.S. material support statute and sanctions authorities, as well as international restrictions, such as U.N. sanctions and sovereignty and access issues, and practical on-the-ground issues like logistics and physical security concerns. I describe this panel as the Rashomon panel on humanitarian aid, if you're familiar with the Akira Kurosawa movie. Uh, each panelist brings experience from a different key institutional perspective on the same activity, delivery of humanitarian aid in a challenging, non-permissive or complex emergency environment. In particular, they represent the broad policy level, the think tank, looking at the range of interests, purposes, and potential approaches. The legislative branch, the work in Congress of translating policy ideas into U.S. authorities, restrictions, and oversight. The executive branch, the donor agency, navigating the authorities and restrictions to find and work with implementing partners and the implementing partners themselves, the grantees and contractors who receive U.S. and other funding to physically deliver the humanitarian aid shaped by all of the foregoing. Our panelists today are Jacob Kurtzer, a Director and Senior Fellow for the Humanitarian Agenda at the Center for Strategic and International Studies, CSIS, where he has co-led the CSIS Task Force on Humanitarian Access and written and led several discussions on practically all aspects of access, including one just last week on the unintended consequences of sanctions regimes. Uh, prior to that, he has worked in the field and in congressional relations for the International Committee of the Red Cross, ICRC, another very important, literally founding institution in this space. Uh, next, we'll have Mark Yosi a longtime staffer for the U.S. House Foreign Affairs Committee, including the past four years as deputy chief counsel for the current majority staff. He was the lead drafter of the Global Fragility Act, which became law in December 2019 and encourages interagency coordination and permanently authorized funds for complex crises and stabilization and prevention activities in fragile states. He is an alumnus of Georgetown, a graduate of the law school. He's uh, gone on to do many impressive things since then, but also a particular note for our current students in our course. While he was here, he was a research assistant for Professor Gostin's treatise on global health law. Uh, next, we have Danielle Mouton-Smith. She is currently a managing director for the Bureau of Humanitarian Assistance in the U.S. Agency for International Development. Prior to this, she held several positions in USAID's Office of Food for Peace, a foundational cornerstone of U.S. humanitarian aid 
dating back to 1954, preceding U.S. aid itself. And as a reflection on the interconnections of the institutions of foreign aid, she's also been lead congressional liaison for humanitarian and transition issues. She holds a PhD in public policy as well. She wrote her dissertation on global food security. And last but not least, we have Emily Bussigel. Uh, for the past several years, she has been Deputy Chief Compliance Officer and was previously Associate, Associate Corporate Counsel at the International Medical Corps, IMC, uh, which is a major implementing partner in global health and humanitarian aid. She brings a wealth of firsthand experience with the concerns and challenges of actual delivery of aid. Thank you in advance to all of them. We've done versions of this panel for a few years now, and it's uh, been enlightening in new ways every time. So thank you also again to Susan and Liddy uh, for giving us this platform today. And a uh, final note, uh, those of us employed by the U.S. government, including myself, are speaking in our personal capacities based on our own development uh, expertise. Any views expressed are our own and not those of the U.S. government. Now, to give some overview of the topic, uh, every year the U.S. government provides 25 to 30 billion in dollars in non-military official development assistance, ODA, around the world. In 2019, pre-pandemic, it of its total ODA, about 8.6 billion was humanitarian aid. Last week, uh, President Biden released his foreign aid budget request for next year to Congress. In it, he asked for an overall 10% increase, including 10 billion for humanitarian assistance and 10 billion for global health, which in turn includes 1 billion for global health security. All of this is objectively a lot of money, to be sure, but it amounts to less than 0.2% of the annual federal budget. As one former USAID administrator often notes, the entire U.S. civilian foreign service is smaller than the Department of Defense marching band. In terms of numbers of people in need uh, of humanitarian aid, last year, United Nations agencies put out public appeals estimating close to 168 million people in need. In their coordinating roles and recognizing the limits of resources available, they targeted only 109 million for humanitarian aid activities. As for practical considerations, when we talk about humanitarian aid, we mean many things. Aid in response to natural or man-made disasters in complex environments where the cooperation of local authorities is not assured. Activities include responding to basic needs for survival, including search and rescue, food, clean water, shelter, sanitation, healthcare and security, and even in protracted crises, education. In providing this aid, donors and their implementers must negotiate issues of donor conditions, such as statutory and policy authorities and restrictions, access, permission from the host government to enter and operate freely, humanitarian principles, such as humanity, neutrality, impartiality, and independence, and increasingly codes of conduct for aid workers, such as the SPHERE project, a standard which over 600 NGOs have voluntarily committed to, and the UN-led Interagency Standing Committee's principles for protection from exploitation and abuse. All of these carry real risks for humanitarian organizations and their staff. Interaction and industry alliance of hundreds of agent implementers identifies four types. Fiduciary risks regarding compliance with donor requirements. Security risks, including physical safety. Legal risks, including potential legal liability from counter-terror regulations and sanction regimes, especially for NGO grantees who have no in-country privileges and immunity protections and operational and financial risk, where they might do everything right, but things still don't work out, such as when equipment gets lost or damaged. Simply put, it's not a simple matter to do right well. With that context, uh, we'll hand it over to our panel now, uh, who will each speak for about 10 minutes. Our first panelist, Jacob Kurtzer. Welcome, Jacob. Thanks, Amit. Thank you, Susan, for convening this important event and for continuing to shine a light on this a uh, very important issue. At the humanitarian agenda at CSAS, we think about ways, we analyze US policy and we think about ways in which it can be improved and specifically as it relates to humanitarian assistance in complex settings. And by complex settings, we're talking about conflict affected countries. The task force that you mentioned, co-chaired by Senators Young and Booker, looked at the denial of humanitarian access. And by humanitarian access, we mean both the ability of aid agencies to affect, to reach conflict affected populations, but also those civilians themselves caught up in the crossfire, their ability to access humanitarian assistance. And we identified a series of, uh, of access challenges, safety and security, um, the logistical constraints and some of the contexts where infrastructure is poor, and the bureaucratic constraints frequently imposed by the host governments in terms of visas, taxes, or other restrictions, 
but also put in place by donor governments themselves. And the bottom line up front for today's conversation is that our analysis has shown that the legal and regulatory measures in which humanitarian assistance operates in from the United States government undermines the outcomes that we want to achieve, both in terms of the health and well-being of the affected populations but also in terms of the efficiency and effectiveness of the programs as a U.S. national interest and priority. And so we believe that in consultation with humanitarian partners and various other civil society actors, that a series of fixes, either through executive orders, through actions by Congress, or through fixing some of the processes within the agencies themselves, could do wonders to improve the provision of humanitarian assistance, achieve better outcomes for affected populations, and for taxpayer dollars to get the most value for the money that we're spending on humanitarian assistance. So stepping back, one key issue for the past 20 years has been the various restrictions that have been put in place since the attacks of September 11. These include um, legislative language like the material support for terror provision, which prohibits the provision of any assistance, including um, advice to groups designated as terrorist organizations, as well as various executive order sanctions put in place by different administrations. And even the grant language put in place by USAID and the State Department have all negatively impacted the ability of humanitarian agencies to respond. Um, we're at an interesting moment now, right? There's a, a significant public shift in public dialogue in the way that we talk about a counterterrorism lens in US foreign policy. And it sh that shift has, has emphasized the various ways in which a, a strict and almost laser-like focus on counterterrorism has impacted various other U.S. foreign policy priorities. And that includes also, I think, a willingness to rethink sanctions as a tool in the manner in which they're implemented. We saw that this administration, the Biden administration, announced very early on an executive order that looked at, among other things, the way that sanctions were impacting the COVID-19 response and looking at and suggesting that uh, finding ways to create exemptions for humanitarian action within existing sanction programs. So while we sometimes talk about this issue as one of reconciling various different U.S. government priorities, what I think we're actually talking about is finding a way to improve and enhance the performance of an incredibly valuable U.S. government and program that's humanitarian assistance, which, like you say, in the overall pot of money that we're spending is quite small. But when you look at the amount of money that the United States spends relative to the total pot of humanitarian assistance, small improvements in the way that the U.S. government does humanitarian assistance would have an outsized impact on the overall humanitarian response globally. It's important to think, I think, to, to also contextualize this in the history of the United States as a humanitarian actor. Humanitarian assistance has historically been a bipartisan proposition. Uh, members of Congress from both sides of the aisle have historically given a large amount of support to provision of humanitarian assistance in individual countries and for the programs as a whole. There are various different rationales in, presented by policymakers about that. Um, there's the moral and ethical duty. We have the capacity to help and therefore we should. There's a legal duty when the United States is a party to a conflict it brings upon itself certain uh, international law responsibilities to respond to the civilians impacted by that conflict. And frequently there's a national interest uh, rationale presented that by providing humanitarian assistance, you help reduce instability, you can, you can, you know, uh, spending now helps create, helps uh, prevent bigger challenges in the future. So there are various different reasons why people have, members of Congress and administrations on both sides of the aisle have supported humanitarian assistance. But if, with all of these rationales, what you find is that we're handcuffing ourselves. The legal frameworks that we operate in undermine these achievements. And we're also impacting negatively other second order goals in the humanitarian ecosystem. So the restrictions reduce our ability to effectively respond to all civilians caught up in conflict, but they also have impacted our ability to meet other goals in the humanitarian ecosystem. So for example, there is a commitment towards localization of humanitarian assistance, towards having country-based providers be in the lead. But when you have this very complicated legal and regulatory environment to act in, it makes it very difficult for an organization in Syria, in Yemen, in South Sudan 
to have the legal and bureaucratic knowledge of how the U.S. government works to be able to comply with the regulations that in place. So if we're supposed to get to a, a, a future where those organizations are in the lead and working directly with donor governments, but we have this extremely onerous regulatory environment, we undermine, I think, our ability to do so. And that, in turn, undermines the ability for these communities to have embedded within themselves the resilience to respond to future shocks, because they will continue to rely on the support of and the introduction of international actors to assist them. And so we also, I think, have to think about the impact of the U.S. regulatory framework on the, on the globe, right? The power of the U.S. dollar means that even individuals who aren't sanctioned or even institutions, even in contexts where there aren't specific um, restrictions in play, financial institutions become very risk averse when thinking about responding to um, providing financial services for humanitarian organizations. We also know that the United States can be a norm generator for good or for ill. So when it, sometimes the United States has put in place certain restrictions or designations on foreign terrorist organizations, or put in place restrictions on um, NGO or international organization action in complicated countries, partner organizations or host governments mimic that language in their own domestic legal frameworks. And so one of the things that you'll often hear when you talk to US government agencies is, well, we've never really prosecuted NGOs for some of these violations if they're done in, in good faith. But we don't have that same level of confidence in, say, for example, the Nigerian government, which has mimicked a lot of the U.S. government language in its um, domestic legal framework with respect to the situation in northeast Nigeria with Boko Haram. And so you, you have these second-order effects, right? You have bank de-risking, the inability to provide financial services. And you also have to remember that humanitarian organizations don't operate in a vacuum. They rely on private sector contractors and vendors to procure um, the materials. So we saw this in the case with Yemen, when the previous administration put in place a foreign terrorist organization designation on the Houthis. They did so with a mass, a very um, forward-leaning exemption program for NGOs that did not solve the problem of the private vendors that the NGOs were relying upon for food and other essential items were saying, heck no, we're out, because we don't want to run afoul of a U.S. sanctions program. And so you have these second order effects that even the way the existing laws and the possibilities for remedying them for NGOs, um, you know, the second order effects mitigate the impact of um, uh, the, the provisions underway to help NGOs work. So we've done some analysis on this, and there's a whole community of actors from the NGOs themselves to other think tanks who are working on this um, extremely closely. And what we think is that the system, just as it is, doesn't work anymore. And so there have been a couple of broad scope recommendations that have been put forward, which I'll which I'll touch on now, and then I'll I'll turn it over to you know the, the rest of the panel to to take it forward from there. Um, in the context of COVID nineteen, I think the urgency of the current situation, including how um, the spread anywhere affects variants. Um, people have called for an immediate global license. While we sort out some of the, the more specific licenses and exemptions uh, issues, to allow um, humanitarian organizations to respond effectively and efficiently in various countries to, to COVID-19. I also think we need to start from a place of permissiveness when we, come, when we think about humanitarian action. The executive orders put in place since September, you know, since the, by different administrations, um, tend to have extracted an existing humanitarian exemption and required organizations to then apply for one. We believe that the exemption should exist, and if the extenuating circumstances in an individual context necessitate creating a humanitarian restriction, to do so. But we should start from a place of permissiveness, and I think that relates to what should be a relationship of trust between the United States government and its partners in humanitarian action. And I think three, we need a clearer and more concise process with respect to applying to Treasury and the State Department for licenses and exemptions. And four, ultimately, the biggest lift is going to be for Congress to fix the material support for terror provision and clarify its intent with that specific law about what it means in terms of restricting the ability of organizations um, to engage with or, or come close to, to foreign terrorist organizations. I want to conclude with one very brief point. People talk about do no harm in humanitarian action. I don't think that's a realistic standard. I think we need to talk about harm reduction and really think about 
balancing the various interests at play when the United States government provides assistance to help vulnerable people in conflict-affected countries. And a more realistic way of thinking about it, I think will get us a long way towards solving some of this problem. Thank you. Thank you, Jacob. Uh, uh, very important things you highlighted. We really appreciate how you brought out the fact that there are secondary legal risks, risks that are created by the restrictions that exist. Um, the thought that a recipient country may create, establish laws that mirror the US laws creates a whole other jurisdiction of potential legal liability uh, for implementers who are acting in good faith. And uh, also an important point about bank de-risking. Um, the, the legal risks in this space are uh, for anyone who might be involved. So you get a situation where banks just decide they're just not gonna provide financial services to implementers on the ground. And think about the practical impact that has. You just can't even uh, get access to your money uh, through normal means. Um, and also uh, thanks for flagging uh, the proposed, uh, the idea of doing legislative fixes uh, for the material support statute. Um, as many people here are aware, it's been attempted a few times. There are drafts that are out there, Humanitarian Access Facilitation Act of 2013 and, and a version in 2015, where the text actually, it, it wouldn't take much. It would be a very simple fix to the wording, but it becomes a question of uh, political will to do something like that. Uh, thanks so much. Uh, next, uh, we have Mark, Mark Yozzi. I mean, thank you. Um, that actually sort of dovetails pretty well into, into what I wanted to talk about, which is really the role of Congress in this space, or the, the foundations of what are, what are Congress's um, Article One authorities here, and how do we shape policy through those, and what kinds of problems do we cause when we do that, and what kinds of opportunities do we um, do we create? There's really three ways that we engage on this. We, we authorize the, the legal frameworks for these programs um, with delegating authority and then controlling how that authority is used with you know, pros and cons of how that control plays out. We appropriate the funds to actually fund the assistance and we conduct oversight over how that, um, that those, these programs are carried out in the field, both to inform future legislation for example, to suss out the problems that the material support restrictions have caused and, and consider ways to, um, to affect those in the future. Um, and then also to engage directly to influence how the programs are, are carried out. Um, and that you know, Congress, perhaps um, the executive branch and others at times would prefer that Congress um, sort of just sat back and legislated, but sometimes members of Congress want to be more forward leaning and sort of shape what happens in the field and, and, um, and take that liberty. Um, I mentioned um, the Global Fragility Act, and maybe that's sort of a, a, as good a framework as any to talk about sort of what we do in these spaces. Um, in the authorizing stage, and that is authorizing legislation, um, we lay out the parameters for a program. The Global Fragility Act is supposed to take sort of the interagency lessons learned from you know, 20 years of US engagement in armed conflicts and try to update US programming, the planning um, and organizational structure for US programs to take advantage of those lessons learned and to have sort of more evidence-based interventions going forward um, and to sort of break down some of the silos that exist between USAID and the State Department, the Department of Defense is, you know, these various organizations are funding and carrying out programs in these, these same spaces um, to make sure that sort of we're leveraging the, the whole of US government um, capabilities and the capabilities of our international partners. Something else that we can do that we did um, in the Global Fragility Act and the Congress has done in the past is establish sort of multilateral funds to leverage the, um, the other donors that are working in a space and try to have a more um, coherent approach. Um, these are things that the executive branch could do on its own, but it's also something that Congress can push the executive branch to do and then put funds into the, that, um, those, those uh, those accounts to actually push things forward. And that's where the, the appropriating side comes in. Um, you know, we set the, the actual money and we can set restrictions on how that those, those appropriations are used to further particular policy objectives of members of Congress. Um, you often hear that a, a lot of foreign assistance funds are over earmarked, right? That they're, and what that means specifically is we appropriated some money, but then we say at this amount, a certain amount has to be used for this kind of program and a certain amount has to be used for this kind of program. And that um, means that members of Congress are controlling how the funds are being used rather than it being sort of a, a field driven process. And I think there's a risk when Congress controls funds that it means that the funds can't be as nimble and able to respond to actual needs in the field. Um, 
from a member of Congress perspective, if you really care about um, you know, early childhood education or child and maternal health, that isn't a problem. That's sort of a, a feature uh, because now you've got a, limit, a, a specific amount of funding for that. And with respect to the Global Fragility Act, sort of carrying that forward um, as a framework, um, there's been you know, there's a debate right now over whether in appropriating funds that the Global Fragility Act authorized funds, but then Congress has to come in and, and actually appropriate the money to actually put the money into an account, whether we should be earmarking funds specifically for priority countries under the Global Fragility Act or not. And there are sort of pros and cons to, to that debate. If we really want to fund this new initiative, we're probably going to have to dedicate some funds to it. However, there's a top line amount, a total dollar amount that Congress is going to appropriate. So once we earmark some funds for global fragility, they're off the table for something else. So there are always pros and cons to, to Congress being in this space. And then from an oversight perspective, you know, if you look at, say, a, a complex right, uh, conflict like Yemen, um, you know, Congress has been very engaged in the provision of humanitarian assistance to Yemen, both in talking to um, sort of the, the Saudi coalition side of the conflict, um, and also in thinking about what a Houthi terrorist designation, which the last administration designated, and, and um, um, the Houthis as a terrorist organization, which then has all of these implications under the material support statute. And fortunately, that's been um, been removed. But there's um, but there's um, sort of always uh, a risk that certain things that Congress legislates, for example, uh, a prohibition on material support for designated terrorist organizations, will have or what, what I would see as unintended consequences on the other side for restricting humanitarian assistance. And that's really where, in addition to engaging with all the sides, again, the facts, Congress needs to be coming back and updating authorities to address problems that we see emerging in this space. And I think material support is, a, is, is a sort of a sticky issue that I, I certainly hope Congress is, is going to solve um, in, in the near term. But you know, the, a prohibition on providing support to terrorists sort of, I think, strikes your average American, your average member of Congress as just sort of common sense, good policy, right? Why would we be wanting to provide support for terrorism? So walking that back, you have to, you have to sort of deal with the politics of, well, now we're actually maybe going to be providing some support to terrorism, and that's some sort of a political non-starter. Um, so you need a different way to look at that issue, right? And, and a way to think about what's, what is the, the, the proper U.S. role in, in an armed conflict, in, um, and who are, who are we harming um, and whether, by, by a prohibition on material support? And um, are we actually undermining our objectives in combating terrorism um, by taking sort of such a hardline position? Um, the last thing I'll say is, in, in all of these uh, pieces of legislation, Congress often provides waivers, but those waivers often are not as simple and efficient as, as Congress might think. So um, often it means that Congress needs to have, a, uh, have a, a more detailed look at the legislation. So I'll leave it there for now. And I, I guess I should note before we move on that, um, that unfortunately, I, I have a hard stop at, at 1.30. Um, so hopefully we'll have a chance for a few questions before then. Uh, thanks very much, Mark. Uh, a lot of key points here as well. Uh, appreciate the push and pull of the legislative and executive branches for how prescriptive a statutory authority might be. Uh, to your point, uh, I think it's noteworthy um, that the main U.S. government authority for foreign aid, the Foreign Assistance Act of 1961 as amended, originally had a requirement. Basically, every single time the U.S. government was going to do humanitarian aid, Congress had to pass an amendment to that act to authorize it as in something would happen in a country, an earthquake or something in one country, Congress would have to say, and now we're gonna amend the FAA to say, you can do humanitarian aid in this country. Uh, in 1975, uh, they amended it to give a permanent standing authority for international disaster assistance. So I think that's an example of where the push and pull got readjusted uh, in response to uh, practical realities. And, and I think a, arguably a, a shift in American attitudes to uh, other countries. Um, also appreciated uh, outlining the three layers of congressional control for the authority and the actual funds. You can't do anything with authority if you don't have the money um, and, and oversight, uh, as well as uh, the reference to uh, the way the material support statute works out um, and the OFAC sanctions, sorry, and the authority to designate entities as foreign terrorist organizations, uh, where the previous president made a designation and uh, President Biden had discretion and withdrew that designation, uh, which as currently set out, could have probably, would have arguably all been moot if 
there had been a blanket carve out uh, for good faith humanitarian activities in the first place. Uh, but thanks also for noting that uh, fixes may be potentially simple on paper, but the way they work out, um, even when there is a fix, uh, they can be complicated. Uh, thanks uh, so much for that, Mark. Uh, next, we have Danielle Mouton Smith. Um, and, and thanks everyone for having me here today. Um, I'll start by just giving a little context on the USAID frame, framework right now. We, we stood at the Bureau for Humanitarian Assistance at USAID um, in June of, 20, uh, June of 2020. So it's relatively new um, in, in USAID world. And it brought together the Office of Foreign Disaster Assistance and the Office of Food for Peace into one merged entity so we can respond to humanitarian crises around the world um, in a more cohesive manner. Um, today, I want to reflect on a few aspects of how law and policy practically impact the implementation of the U.S.'s humanitarian assistance programs globally. Uh, there's a strong belief in, you know, around the government, around the world, that our humanitarian programming and humanitarian assistance should be primarily guided by humanitarian principles, including humanity, neutrality, impartiality, independence, and universality. But any assistance provided by a donor government is not devoid of influence by domestic laws, interests, or foreign policy goals as well. Likewise, international policy like UN sanctions may also impact how well these principles can be upheld. As humanitarians, our primary focus remains on providing assistance to those who need it most, but that means a big part of our jobs is navigating the complexity that policy and law brings to the picture. So we're lucky in the humanitarian space here in the U.S. that we do have some tools that help to ensure assistance can be delivered despite other political issues at times. Uh, U.S. legislation, as, as Mark was just saying, is riddled sometimes with amendments and such that are driven by special interests that could ultimately slow down the provision of aid um, in an emergency or make our programs less, less effective. But there are tools like both the International Disaster Assistance and the Food for Peace Act, which are our primary authorities and the primary, the primary authorities by which our funding flows um, in, at USAID. Um, we have notwithstanding authority, and that's a critical tool for us to rely on in terms of applying and, and implementing our programs. Notwithstanding allows humanitarian assistance programs to be carried out even when another provisional law may have prevented it. So I'm just gonna think of an example. One might be like uh, the Brooke Amendment that basically restricts aid to a country that's defaulted on low pay loan payments to the United States. Without the notwithstanding authority that we have via our authorities, we wouldn't be able to necessarily provide aid to a country like Somalia, which obviously is someplace in, in, in dire need of humanitarian assistance um, year, year on year. So not having that notwithstanding authority would limit our ability to respond to a crisis in Somalia. So it's, it's a really important tool for us to have in our pocket. Um, there's many other places where notwithstanding becomes um, a, a critical way of making sure that our programming isn't hampered by other laws. Um, there's things from vehicle waivers to, to more complex issues, um, but they're all, you know, because U.S. law is so complicated and there are so many interests, it's really important that we have ways to, to, to flag where, um, where something, something minor like a vehicle waiver would really impede our, our partner's ability to program quickly and expeditiously on the ground. Um, I, I wanted to point out an interesting point, though, that we can't not withstand administration policy. Um, so one example would be that for that we have something called the Cargo Preference Act of 1954, which requires uh, the U.S. government agencies to use U.S. flag vessels to ship a minimum of 50 percent cargoes on U.S. flag vessels. For, for USAID, for humanitarian assistance programming, that's largely U.S. food aid programs, commodities bought here in the U.S. and shipped overseas. We do have notwithstanding authority that allows us to um, go around this uh, law if needed, if there is an emergency, if there's a lack of ship availability or timing issues or cost um, exceed ability or sometimes access and security issues that might, might arise. We could use a foreign flag vessel. We could notwithstand that law. But if a president were to pass a cargo preference executive order, which has been bantered around for, for many years, um, and, and say that there's 100% 
requirement for the use of U.S. flag vessels for, for U.S. cargoes, this would be something we're kind of beholden to and unable to get around. So we're not just watching kind of a legislative space, but we're also trying to watch kind of what's happening in the executive branch and how executive orders and different policies that might be passed by an administration might limit uh, our ability to perform, um, you know, perform well in the humanitarian space. Um, so I wanted to also mention the broad legal framework that the U.S. humanitarian assistance programming has and the limitations and flexibilities there as well. Um, we have two main accounts, as I mentioned earlier, international disaster assistance, which is quite flexible, um, and Title II of the Food for Peace Act, um, Act, which is more restrictive and can constrain our response options at times. Title II assistance is largely tied to U.S. commodities, and so the vast majority of funds provided to carry out Title II must be used to procure and ship commodities from the U.S. and sent to points of crisis overseas. But what happens when U.S. commodities aren't the right response option um, and the, 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 the legislative authorities limit us? A decade ago, before the Bureau of Humanitarian Assistance existed and we, when we were just an Office of Food for Peace, Title II was the only U.S. funding source available for emergency food assistance. And so if a crisis emerged where in-kind commodities were not appropriate, because, for example, it could cause market disruptions locally or might take months to arrive by the time it was procured and shipped, there wasn't really any other option for us. This was limiting to the ability to respond effectively in many situations. And the past few administrations have sought reforms of Title II to make it a more flexible tool and untie all or some of its funding from U.S. commodity um, exclusivity. Over time, as complex crises illuminated the need for other tools, IDA became available for emergency food assistance purposes as well. And this allowed for the procurement of commodities internationally, as well as the ability to provide food with food vouchers or cash transfers in local markets were available. So practically, without this flexibility, a response like the ones that we have mounted for refugees in Jordan and Lebanon and Turkey over the years coming out of the Syria crisis would have been difficult for the U.S. to support with just the Title II authorities alone. Um, so our consideration as a donor is what's the best response option? And looking at the idea of bringing in bulk U.S. commodities to a sophisticated market like the one in Jordan would have caused major market disruptions, negatively impacting local businesses and farmers at a time when stability was really critical in countries surrounding Syria. Also, most refugees are not in camps, but living in urban settings where grocery stores are easily found. And so distributing commodities, as is done in rural settings in, say, parts of Africa with refugee, um, with refugee communities, would have been expensive, logistically difficult, and potentially a security risk. So we knew food vouchers and cash transfers that allowed refugees to go to local markets and support host community businesses was the right programmatic approach. But if we had only had the Title II, this response would not have been possible. So really, it's important that, that Congress is kind of looking at and working with us to figure out how we can best use our legislative authorities to mount the best responses. Um, we're very good now at juggling the various provisions of Title II and IDA together. Um, but sometimes instead of making what is the best response choice, we make the second best option based on the availability of a funding source um, because of different constraints that we have, not on what's the best programmatic decision or best um, tactic to respond to a crisis. And lastly, I just wanted to touch on some of the, the issues that, of the counterterrorism policies that others have sp spoken to as well. Efforts to counter terrorism by the U.S., other donors, and international organization undoubtedly creates challenges and barriers for humanitarian response for partners on the ground. 20 years ago, even a decade ago, most humanitarian assistance was going towards natural disasters and recurrent crises like drought. And now the majority is going towards conflict settings and man-made crises. And the operating environment continues to become more complex and we continue to try and adapt to it. There are conversations in many settings about the risk tolerance donors have for money or resources potentially being diverted or getting into the hands of the wrong people and how that burden of upholding the responsibility for counterterrorism policy falls on implementing partners primarily. And there's risk both ways. If we as donor governments aren't vigilant enough, there's a risk of resources potentially being misused. Um, and, and, and if donors go too far, we make the environment so restrictive that our, no partner is willing to work with us and take that risk on. And as a global community, we haven't found that sweet spot yet. Um, and there are various perspectives on it. But what is that risk tolerance level? 
that we're willing to take? Um, and how do we make sure that primarily we're, we're, we're focused on reaching people in need? And, and this most recently came up with the FTO designation that Mark mentioned with Yemen and how had that gone forward, millions of people would have lost critical assistance in a place where famine was looming. So how do we balance those, those tensions between the two different types of risk? So as humanitarians, I just want to close by saying, you know, what makes carrying out this, all of this kind of carrying out humanitarian assistance in today's world so difficult and complex. So we're trying to keep our eye on the goal of reaching as many people as we can and staying true to humanitarian principles. And the challenges presented from minor vehicle waivers to sanctions keep evolving. And so we will continue to try to learn, pivot, and evolve our tactics to deliver aid effectively within those constraints. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much, Daniel. Well, thanks very much. A lot of key points there. Uh, first, uh, I'd like to highlight is you noted flexibility. Uh, the International Disaster Assistance Authority in the Foreign Assistance Act includes a provision that says it's notwithstanding any other provision of law that might impede it. And so that's another example of uh, Congress acknowledging a need to be flexible where it can, where it's politically uh, feasible to say that if there's something that we've legislated that isn't on point to this, that we didn't really mean to legislate in this space, but somehow it's tripping you up in doing the foreign aid, you can go ahead and do that, notwithstanding um, that other thing that we didn't intend to be a factor. Uh, another thing that Danielle highlighted is that our authorities come from Congress. Congress passes the laws, and uh, the lawmakers are beholden to constituents, uh, whether it's uh, individual citizens or business interests. Uh, and those are factored into the authorities we get. Uh, the way the Foreign Assistance Act was originally written uh, back in 61, um, the default setting was pretty much to do use U.S. contractors for everything. Um, and that was part of the case that was made to get the thing passed, was to say, this is going to uh, be in the economic interest of U.S. citizens. Uh, that got amended uh, in the mid-90s to say, okay, there's a lot of other policy concerns, and we realize um, that uh, increasingly the private sector is a driving factor uh, for these businesses, and there's a benefit to having localization, as has been mentioned earlier, to working with local organizations. They created the flexibility, they amended the law to say our default is U.S. implementers and uh, developing country local implementers, and then maybe the rest of the world. So that's an example of how that interest will flag. Uh, she mentioned uh, motor vehicles. So that part of state, that's still there. There's still a preference for using U.S. motor vehicles. Um, but there's a waiver authority where that's just not practical. Like there's not going to be a, a garage that can fix an American car or isn't used to, you know, that kind of equipment. So that's a, a practical reality. Uh, she talks about uh, uh, Title II Food for Peace Act, right? That was a different legislative purpose when it was originally passed. It was partly to largely to get rid of surpluses that the American government had stored up during uh, the Great Depression. Uh, so that was kind of was a legacy of a different policy interest. And uh, foreign aid is just one of many that are factored into any authorities, in, in, any foreign aid authorities. The long title, the official title of the Foreign Assistance Act itself notes that it is in the interest of the economic and security interests of American citizens. Uh, so thanks for highlighting all of that. Uh, um, lastly, uh, we have Emily Busigel. Emily. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you very much for having me on to represent the implementing partner side of this. And as you can tell, our job is, is rather risky and rather difficult. There's a lot of legal requirements and legal restraints that we work in. So just a little bit about the framework of how an implementing partner thinks about, you know, how, how they can deliver aid is we receive money from a lot of different donors often. You know, uh, I, I work for an NGO. It's an American-based NGO. We receive money from the U.S. government, the U.K. government, the EU, the U.N., but many different donors, all with their own sets of rules and regulations. So some of which we've talked about on this call, which is, you know, OFAC sanctions and, and, and other the material support provision, other things that restrict us from the U.S. side. But we also have other laws um, that we have to operate under. We also have to comply with the laws and the places that we're operating in. And that can be just that can vary so much from place to place. I think my organization works in around 30 countries now. Each country has a unique legal system. Some don't have legal systems. Some have multiple legal systems within a single country. Uh, countries can be uh, controlled by different groups in different areas. And so that also poses you know, difficulties in implementing partners' work. 
And then the third thing I want to mention is that we also have contract, contract law responsibilities based on the grant agreements that are given to us by each of our implementing partners. So it's not just the laws that are passed by the the laws that all of our donor countries have to comply with and they have in their, you know, in their kind of legal systems, but also what's in your exact contract term based on your, your each different program that you're implementing. So provides, it means we have to operate under a lot of different uh, legal regimes, a lot of moving pieces that we have to kind of think about in all of our work. Um, and I'm going to just dive in and give some examples specific examples of where this comes up in a, you know, in a, in a first response and in an initial emergency. And then also kind of talk about as we continue to keep our programs going, what we have to monitor in them to make sure that we are complying with our, um, with the different legal regimes that we're working in and all the things that, that people um, talked about uh, from things as specific as vehicle waivers, making sure we're, we're using the right vehicles to making sure we're complying with the sanctions um, laws. So um, just, you know, if we, if you think about, okay, there's a, a new pandemic in a country that we're, that, you know, my organization is not working in, what are the first things that a lawyer in my organization thinks about when they receive word that we're going to be sending people out? The first thing we think about is sanctions, probably. Um, we think about, are there external restrictions on, on us and what we can do in that country? Um, and sanctions laws differ by jurisdictions. We obviously uh, look at, you know, the U.S. government sanctions, but also U.N., EU, U.K., those types of things. Um, and when that happens, so for example, my organization rather recently started uh, implementing programs in Venezuela. And so what do you do? You work really closely with the programs on the ground to make sure that every single thing they're doing, from buying gas to hiring employees to um, opening bank accounts and every single little thing that they're doing complies with those sanctions laws because it's such a big risk for us. And it's, I think, as people mentioned, it's such a, um, not, I want, I don't want to say it's easy to run afoul of those rules, but it's, you know, there's no fault involved and you can, their mistakes can be made. So you have to be incredibly careful in this area. Um, it, you know, things, in, it includes what kind of mobile phones can your, can your, um, employees use? Um, you know, sometimes we're, there's restrictions on technology. There's things like import and export restrictions that often go hand in hand with sanctions. So in an initial deployment, you could imagine telling somebody who's being diverted, a doctor who's being diverted to, you know, deploy to a new country, hey, I don't know that you can bring your laptop there because there may be, you know, export restrictions involved. Why don't you just ditch it in your airport locker? Like that's a type of, <laughs> type of advice that sometimes NGO lawyers have to give on the fly. Um, and you may not know at that time, but you have to play it safe. Um, so then another thing that you have to do when you first start um, implementing in a new country is register. And um, registering in a new country with different legal regimes can be incredibly difficult and incredibly time consuming. Um, sometimes there's an emergency authorization from the central government to allow your NGO or other or any NGO to work um, during an initial disaster time, but you have to make sure your activities are authorized within that emergency authorization and that your staff who's going to deploy can actually do their work. So if it's a doctor, are they certified to work in that country? Will they be certified under the whatever emergency authorization there is? Um, you have to make sure your staff has the right visas. I mean, that some things as little as getting people to the places can be incredibly difficult and time consuming and has to be done really fast. Um, you have to open new bank accounts. You have to um, figure out how to keep your staff secure. I think that um, Amit talked at the beginning about how security is an enormous challenge for implementing partners and one that we do bear the entire, almost the entire risk on. We have to make sure that our staff that we're sending into new countries are safe. And we have to also make sure that we can get them out if necessary. Because not sometimes there are times when you need to evacuate staff if there's a a conflict or some uh, or other issues. And another thing about registering um, with a new, in a new place, you also have to be very careful as NGO that you're not being manipulated by the government you're working with or, and that your aid's not being interfered with. So this is one of the things we talked about with the goal of humanitarian aid is to not be political, to you know, help the, the, the populations of greatest need. Often the governments of countries that you're going into want your aid to be more political. I mean, they prefer that your aid is directed to, you know, the, the parties or the people that they feed favor or in a, a way that's politically favorable for them. So you have to make sure that your 
your work is not being interfered with or, or manipulated in any way. So it's another important thing to think about at the beginning of any response. Um, and then just a couple of examples on the logistics side. In a lot of these new disasters, an incredibly difficult thing to do is to communicate with the staff that is being brought into the country. So we're talking about things like satellite phones. Can you can you bring a satellite phone into the country? Where does your satellite phone work? Where will it work from? You need to rent cars. Prices are going to be really inflated at the beginning of a of a of an emergency. Do you, you have to worry about whether the U.S. government's going to say, "Oh, you pay too much for that rental car." I think that was a that was a fraud. Um, that's a false claim against the U.S. government. I'm going to sue you under the False Claims Act. You have to make sure that you document every single thing that you do, so that you're not subject to that type of risk. Um, I'll talk about fraud a little bit more in a, in a minute. Um, you need to get medicine, and you need to get other supplies, tents, sometimes that type of thing into the country. Um, and there's great coordination mechanisms that, that work on this. It's not every NGO out for themselves. The UN often coordinates in, in initial emergencies, and we work with our partners like BHA and, like other, and with other government agencies and other NGOs to split up the responsibility and to coordinate to make sure that we're really serving the populations as best we can. This is a couple things on the initial response. I also want to talk about three things that, as a lawyer for an NGO, kind of make up a lot of my work, keep me up at night, that kind of thing. Um, the first I mentioned real briefly, anti-corruption and anti-fraud issues. Um, humanitarian aid is often a target for fraud. And the U.S., for example, has two laws that really kind of relate here. The False Claims Act, which I just mentioned, which requires that you know taxpayer funds are sacred and that you cannot that none can be diverted, all need to be used towards the project goals that were provided in the grant agreement. Um, and the second is the FCPA, the Federal Corrupt Practices Act, that, um, that forbids any bribery or corruption um, overseas by a U.S. company with foreign governments. Um, so what do we do to make sure this doesn't happen? Well, we can't always ensure it doesn't happen, but what, what controls do we put in place to mitigate this risk? We have a lot of checks on transactions. We require a lot of review, escalating review as transactions get more risky. Um, we train our staff all the time on spotting red flags for these issues and how to react when you're asked for a bribe. I mean, we, we have trainings on what happens if a government official says, you know, X, Y, Z, what's your first response? What's your second response? What's your third response? And, you know, um, those are hard trainings because we get a lot of hard questions. Um, and we also have um, pretty large in internal investigations um, departments. I think all NGOs internal investigation department have grown over the past few years. Um, I think that my, um, I oversee our internal investigations department. I think we're around 10 um, full-time staff members, um, five of which or seven of which deploy globally all the time to do investigations. Um, and, we, and we discipline staff and we tell our donors about any fraud issues and we're required to pay back that money. So if we, you know, if somebody stole from us in a foreign country, we actually always, pretty much always, especially with government donors, have to pay that money back. Um, and so that's a huge risk for us and a hard hole for a nonprofit organization to fill. Um, a second area of constant concern is um, is sexual exploitation and abuse. And I, this is, I'm gonna talk, I'm gonna end with this one, but I just can't, I cannot not mention it because um, it's really um, the most important thing we do, which is an implementing partner goes out to the field, takes all of these risks of violating laws of doing this work in order to help vulnerable populations. But our staff, the people who go out there are because of the power imbalance and the fact that we're delivering aid, there's a great risk of exploitation of the, of the people that were there to serve. And that ha there have been um, several instances reported in the news and uh, in the last couple of years. And, you know, I think that the entire, um, the entire, you know, area has really improved the work here. And I, and I know that, um, you're, you know, the, the people on this call have worked on this a lot. Um, but from an implementing partner uh, standpoint, I mean, I just want, we have an investigation program, we investigate where we, we do reactive things, but really what we're focusing on is being preventative because sexual exploitation and abuse, just like sexual harassment and other sexual misconduct, it's a tip of the iceberg issue. Most people don't report it. So if you're getting reports, that means 
that there's a lot more happening, right? And so you can't just have an investigations department. You need to have communities who understand what standards of conduct are for, for all of your staff as an implementing partner, feedback mechanisms. They can tell you if something's starting to go wrong. Um, you have to build your programs in a way that emphasizes that, um, that people are safe from A to Z. Nobody gets food alone, all those types of things. And I think I'm running out of time and I want to leave enough time for our closing speakers. So I'm going to I'm going to end there, but it, it keeps going, a list of things that implementing partners have to think about. Um, but it's, and, you know, we take the risk because it's an incredibly rewarding place to be to see the work on the ground. Uh, thanks very much, Emily. A, a lot there. Um, the fact of having to deal with the multiple uh, legal frameworks, uh, the fact of NGO reg registration laws and access issues where implementers, you're, you're neutral, you've got humanitarian principles, but still might end up being pawns in sort of international uh, government disputes. Uh, so moving uh, to the next part, uh, thanks very much to all the panelists, uh, I want to say. Uh, we'll now have concluding remarks by Rachel Alpert, who teaches international law here at Georgetown and is also affiliated with Libby. Thank you very much, and thank you all for joining today. Thank you to, the, to Libby and the O'Neill Institute at Georgetown for hosting this fascinating discussion. And, um, Real big thanks to our panelists for such an engaging discussion and for showing us the multitude of different ways and different facets involved in these challenging humanitarian issues. We heard our panelists bring to life the realities of providing humanitarian assistance from the perspectives of a think tank, an implementer, from Congress, a funding organization. Um, and it, it was really insightful. Um, from, from Jacob Kurtzer, we learned about kind of setting the stage for us to consider the ability of the US to be a leader in this space and a norm generator, but all of the, um, the, the issues that get in the way there, um, how setting kind of the legal and regulatory framework can undermine these outcomes that we wish to achieve, and specifically the material support statute, which was really a theme throughout a lot of these presentations, um, since it's one of the main issues of the day. Um, Jacob underscored the importance of starting from a place of permissiveness rather than restriction. Um, and it's something to consider as poly policymakers navigate these difficult issues. Um, Mark Iozzi then gave us an excellent perspective about the role of Congress in this space, shaping policies through Congress's Article I authorities um, and the role of Congress as the authorizer, appropriator, oversight for the implementation of assistance. Um, we also heard about the difficulties of, of thinking through and implementing, creating the laws to both account for the various pressures in the legislative processes um, and the, the various interests at play in this space. And especially, um, you know, as we think through the current context with the material support statute and the tensions between um, the, the desire not to fund terrorists and at the same time, the real need for humanitarian assistance on the ground and in these challenging areas. Um, next, Danielle Mouton-Smith at USAID um, gave us a, a really insightful perspective about the role of USAID um, in kind of implementing and funding these important humanitarian assistance initiatives. Um, and we learned about the importance of the flexibility and also the limitations um, that the laws can provide. So from Title II, the Food for Peace Act, the expansion of the IDA authority and the importance of notwithstanding authorities to allow humanitarian assistance to be carried out even when otherwise restrictive and the very real impacts of those legal framework challenges and also the changes in the legal frameworks necessary to allow for important humanitarian assistance to be carried out in places like Syria and elsewhere where things like sourcing locally are really important to allow for humanitarian assistance to really um, be implemented fully. And then finally, Emily Bessigal gave us a really great perspective on implementing assistance on the ground, um, the various challenges of working with the multiple funding sources, the legal obligations that um, she navigates on a daily basis with the external restrictions, the internal restrictions, um, both working to set up programs on the ground, ensure compliance with every detail of relevant laws, and compliance concerns like sanctions, False Claims Act, FCPA, the potential exploitation of vulnerable populations, the list 
is endless. Um, and as these speakers have underscored today, and my personal experience having worked with international NGOs in Syria and government as a State Department lawyer and now in private practice, no matter where you are in your career, there are so many ways and so many different angles from which to work on these really important humanitarian assistance issues. Um, even in my current role at, at Jenner and Block, I, I am really um, grateful that I get to work with both funding organizations, so foundations for the most part in this space, as well as implementing organizations to help as they navigate the various sanctions, export controls, and counterterrorism laws that are really challenging as they try to apply their programming. Um, and the ability to kind of gain a cross-cutting perspective from working with multiple organizations from my private sector perspective can be really helpful in both advising organizations as you see the same issue crop up among multiple implementers and also engaging with the U.S. government on their behalf to help raise these issues that um, are really important and negatively impacting the ability to carry out foreign assistance. Um, you know, when you work on humanitarian issues, you work on cutting edge issues that are really important to day-to-day to -day life of everyday people on the ground in places like, like Yemen and Syria, like Burma, Darfur, and the mixes and the fixes of, of dealing with the, you know, challenging legal framework, whether it be sanctions and um, the very real challenges um, inherent in the material support statute um, are really keep this work meaningful and also very challenging. So this panel today has demonstrated the importance of working on these important issues and issues that you are um, personally invested in and continuing to push and challenge yourself in your legal careers. Um, thank you all for joining and please look out for Liddy's next speaker series in the fall. I'm sure it's going to be a really engaging discussion as well. Uh, thank you, uh, Rachel. Uh, this concludes the public portion of our event. Um, so for everyone on Facebook Live, uh, thanks for tuning in. And for everyone in the class, uh, we're going to be sticking around.